Airborne eDNA is new. It's exciting and it's powerful. We are interested in how environmental or eDNA floating in the air can be captured and used to monitor local biodiversity from landscape level monitoring to specific target species of interest. We look specifically at using airborne eDNA to monitor biodiversity remotely and potentially detect species missed by other methods. Biodiversity is threatened in almost every ecosystem on Earth. Most people are surprised to find out that we really have no good ways to monitor species and ecosystems in real time. It is vital that we develop more tools for the biodiversity toolbox and this is one of the potentially game-changing tools for terrestrial ecology. In order to better protect biodiversity, you first have to know what species are present. Current surveys and monitoring don't always identify species that are rare. Just because you don't see or catch them with existing methods doesn't mean that they aren't there. This method could help fill in some of the gaps that we get with existing methods. In my lab, we love innovation. We try high-risk experiments. We use technology in innovative ways. In 2021, we got this idea to try collecting DNA from air samples in a highly controlled lab space. Now we're developing our own inexpensive air samplers and testing them in every situation we can imagine. We suck air through a filter and the DNA becomes trapped on the filter surface. It's like making coffee. The water runs through the filter and the grounds are caught. But in our case, only the DNA is what is caught. We can use this to look for DNA signals from animals and plants in the environment and it's been surprisingly successful. We deploy our samplers in our target area and we leave them running for up to 24 hours. We then store them in their own sterile bags to present contamination both between the sample and the environment and the samples themselves. We then bring them back to the lab where we process them and get lots of unmatched DNA sequences back. We run those sequences through a database to match them to the animals that these sequences come from. Once we have done that, we can match those IDs to the samplers that detected them, and we get an idea of what was in the area. It's a very sensitive method. You need to be extra diligent with your contamination prevention and have a plan to prevent contamination in place before you start. Then, at the bioinformatics stage, you need to think critically about how you approach the data. And you might need to adjust normal bioinformatic conventions to fit your data, study, and sample area. We recently demonstrated that under semi-artificial conditions, we can identify about 90% of the bat species in a closed space. We took a room and we treated it like an artificial cave, and about a thousand individuals from 35 species of bat came in and out of that room over the course of two weeks kind of like a cave with a population coming and going. Using only air samples, we could correctly identify almost all of them, even when we only had one single individual of a species amongst a group of other individuals. We wanted to see if we could use this method to survey wild bat populations in their roosts. If this method would work under these field conditions, it could help address some of the challenges the existing survey methods run into. We were surprisingly successful. Most of these were roosts we have surveyed in other years using nets or camera traps. We had a baseline idea of what was there. We were able to accurately survey the roosts, detecting species that matched existing records in our study area using other methods. One especially exciting detection was the white-winged vampire bat. They were always thought to be in the area, but haven't ever been confirmed with existing methods. It really highlights how airborne eDNA could fill in some of the gaps that traditional monitoring leaves behind. The second thing was that we detected some of the other animals that like to share the roosts, like big-eared climbing rats and some frogs. We got a better idea of how the habitat is being used from the DNA. Our findings confirm that this method can be used in the field to detect wild populations and helps gain a clearer picture of the questions that we have yet to answer. For example, how many samplers do we need to deploy and how long do we need to sample to detect the total diversity of a given airspace? We have been moving step by step from extremely controlled experiments to more and more complex cases. But this is the first time we're really using air sampling for DNA in a truly applied context, in the wild as intended. Now that we have established that this method works, we need to establish a sampling protocol that can maximize its success. Ideally, we will be able to monitor the terrestrial environment in a semi-automated way using eDNA, similar to the way we can for aquatic ecosystems. eDNA has been very well validated in aquatic systems, but it has not been as widely developed or applied on land. Our work is demonstrating that air is a good medium for collecting DNA. There's still a lot we don't know, but it's very promising.
It would be great if this method could be integrated into monitoring frameworks, both commercially and with government organizations, like we see with aquatic eDNA. We think this method can help continually monitor terrestrial biodiversity on a large and long-term scale without increasing the resources and manpower needed to do that. What we need is a globally distributed, semi-automated method to monitor terrestrial ecology. We think eDNA will play a significant part in that, and we are eager to help this move forward.